Halsey, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, you are an artist who has truly experienced the full spectrum of what it is like to be a musician. You know, you, you created music on SoundCloud. You worked hard to be noticed when nobody would notice you. And now, you know, people would look back on your story and go like, oh, you're one of the most streamed artists in the world. You have six billion streams, over six billion streams. It seems like it's overnight success. But when you look at your journey, what does it feel like? When you look at your own journey, does it feel like it was overnight? Or do you go like, man, this has been a long time coming? Um, I, you know what? Thank you, by the way. It is, uh, it's kind of a little bit of both. Like, I, in some ways, feel like I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I'm 26, and I wake up in the morning sometimes, and I'm like, yeah, just been a, it's been a long road. I've, I'm, <laughs> life's almost over. And then other times, I kind of, you know, I just, I put out my third album in January of this year, and... I remember putting it out and thinking to myself, like, I feel like my first album just came out. This is such a, this is such a rush to have that happen. But, you know, I think that kind of, that paradoxical perception of time is probably exactly what I'm supposed to be feeling when I'm living a type of life that I long dreamed about having and didn't really right. think I would get to have. You are, you are one of the people I've seen who has never forgotten, not just the place you've come from in life, but also the fact that so many other people are still there. You know, you, you, you're really outspoken and fighting for, in, in fighting for, you know, people's rights. You, you're out in the streets marching during the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, you, you, were at, you were at the Women's March, you know, right after, you know, Donald Trump became president. You, you shared some of the most personal stories. Um, what, what is it about the world you've left behind that you never leave behind? I witnessed a lot of that dichotomy living in LA because it has some of the like most successful comfortable richest people and then some of the absolute most impoverished and displaced and unhomed and watching those two walks of life coexist in in this bubble is a real eye-opener because I've been on both sides of it um you know I work at a resource center for um unhomed young people in LA who it, it, the, the facility reminds me of one that I used to visit when I needed razors or I needed deodorant. I was like, right. you know, starving artist in New York. And I think it's about keeping yourself immersed in your communities and interacting with those people instead of just kind of living, only interacting with people who are of your class or of your race or of your creed or of your, you know, that's like broaden your horizons, get to understand other walks of life. And that gives you perspective that I think is really valuable. And I'm still learning stuff every day that I don't know about people, you know? That, that's probably one of the things that, that draws people to you is it stems from the music, but they all have a different reason for why they appreciate you. Um, I mean, one of those has now been, you know, your, your new book, you know, a, a collection of poetry. And I'll start by talking about the cover. I was like, this is a beautiful piece of art. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I wonder who, what this was. I, I didn't know who, and then I was like, oh, you you did the art as well. So then I, then I wondered how much art do you do so so it's the music and then you paint and then you do poetry as well and then like what else juggling is what, what else is there <laughs> no i um well gosh i it's funny it's it's like all of my hobbies keep ending up becoming uh part of my job because originally right. originally painting was kind of just the thing that i did for me for fun and then i started incorporating it into my work little by little the poetry was kind of just like I write all the time and I was like, some things you can't sing, you know? And I just wanted to put it out there and let people let people have it and get to know me a little bit in this time where it's so difficult to connect with my fans the way that I'm used to. Cause you know, as a musician, I really don't know when I'm gonna be allowed back on a stage again. Mm -hmm. That makes me very sad. I, I, I love that you say that because when people ask me why I wrote my book, I said, well, there's some things I can't say in my stand-up. There's some things that don't really have a punchline. There's some things that I just wanted to talk to people about. And that's what I wondered when I was reading through this, because some of it felt like it could have been lyrics. There, there are some moments in, 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 these, in these poems where I went, oh, this could have been a lyric to a song, but the poem itself is, is, is the poem. When you share what you share in, in your stories, you know, whether, whether it's talking about um, going through a miscarriage, whether it's talking about surviving sexual assault, whether, whether it's talking about some of the things that most people hide from 
even the closest human beings to them, you've shared with the public en masse. I know that it's therapeutic for you, but what do you hope it will do for others who hear your stories? Well, I mean, I certainly initially feel like I have a sense of responsibility because I do find that people in my position very often only share the good, you know? Um, So I do feel responsible to share kind of my transgressions and my traumas in in a way. Obviously, I still keep some things to myself because I have to have some boundaries. Um, But I was kind of an open book from the start, so I wanted to keep being that way. When I was growing up, I just... I I I grew I was born in 1994. So, you know, the pop star generation that I grew up with was very tailored and very sterile. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were everyone was incredibly talented. It was one of the greatest crop of, you know, musicians we've ever had in that era, that kind of like late MTV era, but everyone was also very polished. You know, we saw what the record label wanted us to see. We saw images that were published in magazines and obviously that stuff started changing when the paparazzi era really evolved. And then all the dark stuff was being shared when the artist didn't want it to be. You know, no consent in it. So I think now it's about kind of finding, finding a nice balance between pulling back the curtain in a way that I have control over. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, you know, learning to keep some stuff to myself because it's healthy to do so. But I think my fans just deserve it. Um, And also like, it's just, it's getting increasingly harder to let people really get to know you with the way that social media is evolving. Like, I think you kind of have to keep adapting to let people, let people in in new ways as the world changes. And this was one for me. When, when you um, talked about being bipolar, it, it was really interesting because many people have shared the story. Not many people, I think, have created music or created art whilst in a, a manic state. You, I mean, you, you said I'm manic and that, that, that's, what, that's what you called the album. Walk me through w- what that's like. Like, w- what would you hope people understand about being bi- bipolar that they don't get? My main goal in talking about it was to get people more comfortable with the idea of talking about mental health because I find often that the conversation around mental health is very um, supportive in theory. And then when someone actually starts displaying symptoms of like psychosis or anxiety or depression, everyone kind of goes like, Ooh, that's a little, I don't know. That's a little too much. Can we go back to just talking about all the good parts, like the things you've overcome and how strong you are. And it's like, I don't always want to talk about how strong I am. Sometimes I want to talk about how weak I am because of it too. It's not always about what I've overcome. It's about what I'm still trying to overcome. And I think that's really important because I just, I find that happen a lot where people will say like, you know, we need to be more accepting. We need to normalize this. We need to make this part of the conversation, which sounds good in theory, but it's like, that's pretty performative. If you're going to, you know, chastise or outcast a person once they start displaying their symptoms. And that makes it harder for people at home who are struggling with mental health problems, right. watching you chastise people in the public eye because they go, wow, that's how they're reacting to that. I'm never telling them about what I'm going through. So I try to, you know, I guess make it digestible in a way. Um, and I, I'm still figuring it out. I'm 26. So I have, <laughs> I have a long way to go for figuring out what the exact science is for discussing mental health, mental health in a palatable way. And if I figure it out, you know, maybe I'll, Maybe I'll even be in for a new career path. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you this, um, whether it's Halsey or whether it's Ashley or whether it's whatever other name, the talent's gonna stay the same. So I don't think you'll be stuck anywhere. Um, congratulations on your success. Thank you for sharing everything with us. And um, we'll see you next time on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks so much, Halsey.